This is another eye roar podcast. Hi, welcome to Storytelling Animals, a green podcast about climate ecology and animal justice where we use books to think about ways out of our uh, environmental crisis. I'm your host, Dayton Martindale, and today my guest is Jeremy Withers. He is an English professor at Iowa State University and the author of a book called uh, Futuristic Cars and Space Bicycles Contesting the Road on American Science Fiction. As part two of my series on um, car dependence in the United States and how we might overcome it, um, we are talking about, yeah, science fiction. We're looking at works from authors spanning the decades, from Ray Bradbury to Ursula K. Le Guin to Octavia Butler to Kim Stanley Robinson, um, and even going back earlier, uh, we mentioned H.G. Wells, for instance, um, and look at how all these authors have depicted transportation. Um, as as Jeremy talks about, you know, it's it's really important to both track how literature has reflected society and also how sci-fi can maybe paint pictures for us of, um, you know, the worlds we could have, what it would look like to still have a a mobile world that's not dependent on everyone having their own private uh, automobile and getting the stuck in traffic and polluting the air and, and all that comes with. Um, if you're curious for more about the problem with the automobile, uh, you can listen to my previous episode with Daniel Knowles on his book Carmageddon, um, but you don't have to listen to these in order if you just want to hear about sci-fi, cars, bikes, and walking. Um, this is the episode for you. A quick note that may be of interest to many of you who listen to my episodes that were more animal rights focused. Um, I didn't unfortunately have time to ask Jeremy about this, but um, a a theme in his book that comes up at least twice is that a lot of these uh, sci-fi works, or at least two of them that I remember, um, are explicit about how cars were also dangerous to non-humans and animal life. Uh, For instance, in Fahrenheit 451, there's a character who kind of says, like, when I'm down, I like to go drive in the highway, go 95 miles an hour and maybe hit some rabbits and dogs. Um, and kind of the the equation of sort of callousness toward animal life with um, callousness about uh, the effects of overuse of cars and dangerous driving. Another note for those of you who like reading books and discussing them, um, as you might if you are listening to a podcast about science fiction, the last Storytelling Animals book club is going to be Tuesday, August 1st, um, or at least the last one for this year. Um, It's going to be Tuesday, August 1st at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific, over Zoom. You can find out what book we are discussing at my website, daytonmartindale.com slash book hyphen club, or by signing up to my free weekly-ish newsletter or my Patreon. Um, You can do a free trial of Patreon now, Um, so that's new. The reason this will be the last book couple of the year and the reason why I think I'm only doing two more episodes this year um, is that I'm starting a grad program uh, at the University of Colorado in Boulder in the fall, and um, I'll be going on at least a temporary hiatus as I get started on that. Um, If you're considering supporting this podcast on Patreon, don't worry, I will also pause your payments starting uh, in September. Lastly, if you are interested in these questions about transportation, um, I have a new article in Sierra Magazine um, about possible futures for planes, trains, and buses and long-distance travel. Um, I'll link that in the episode description as well, um, as well as another less directly related article about um, dinosaurs and mass extinction and environmental ethics uh, that I wrote for the magazine Strange Matters. Um, but you aren't here to hear about my writing, you're here to listen to the podcast, and from Jeremy Withers, about sci-fi, cars, and bikes. So, here you go. Hi, I'm here with Jeremy Withers, the author of Futuristic Cars and Space Bicycles, Contesting the Road in American Science Fiction. Um, Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yes, of course. My pleasure. Thank you for, for having me. It's an honor to be asked to, to come talk about my, my book and my ideas. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed the book, um, and we'll get into some of why shortly. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious kind of more broadly how you got interested in this question of how science fiction portrays you know cars, bikes, and other forms of transportation. Uh-huh, sure. Um, 
Yeah, well, kind of maybe like a lot of academics would say, it, it's it's a, a convergence of just my interests that I have. So I am a, a cyclist, and uh, that's my main form of transportation in, in the town I live in, of, of Ames, Iowa. And I've been doing that for 10, 15 years, trying to, to bike as much as possible and, and getting interested in um, the, the politics of transportation and, and everything that goes into... Uh, our current transportation debates following that that discussion. And then at the same time, I've been uh, teaching literature for 20 plus years now, but specifically uh, teaching science fiction, the history of science fiction for about 10, 12 years now. And just realizing as I was teaching more and more science fiction, just realizing how often cars and bicycles made their appearance in uh, this subgenre of literature, and and initially that that really surprised me. That fascinated me because when I first started teaching science fiction, I was, of course, expecting like a lot of people, lots of um, you know spaceships and and time travel machines and teleporters and uh, fat, you know, all that marvelous, wondrous technology like that. And to see so many cars and bikes, which are you know a bit a bit mundane for the world of science fiction really, really struck me. And, but the fact that I'm, I was outside of my reading practices already so interested in biking and, and cars and transportation stuff just made me realize that I, I, I had to, I had to research this. I had to look more into this because I, I quickly found that it didn't seem like that many people had really written about this that much, weren't really publishing that much on uh, bikes and science fiction or cars and science fiction. So I, I've, I've just made it my, my uh my scholarly agenda if you will for the last uh seven eight years roughly yeah i think um superficially anyway um you might think that science fiction is gonna be more um excited about kind of the higher tech forms of transportation um but you yeah you find there's a lot of bicycles and some of them are higher tech but the you kind of make an argument that even sort of the conventional bicycle is a pretty high tech uh, device when when you think about it. Um, right, right. Yeah, I think that's the other that's the other layer of of my of my study of my argument. Right, is like at first I I argue surprisingly there's a lot of um, depictions of of cars and bicycles in science fiction, but the other thing that surprised me is I was I was struck by how often, and this is what I go into in great great detail in the book is, is how often the, the, the car is is ridiculed in these texts, is is scorned, is denigrated, is not looked at at all as being a a marvelous invention of modernity. It is not at all depicted on the same level as like a, a you know a fascinating starship or an amazing starship. Instead that i I'm finding in a lot of the science fiction I've I've read and consulted, yeah, the car is the, the, the car is a menace, the car is a joke, and so that quickly grabbed my attention, right, because it seemed to me the way that science fiction was um, exploring these transportation debates we're having right now in, in, in the past we've had about who who has rights to the road, who should, who should be allowed to travel on the road, to what degree should we give roads over to, to cars and all of their, you know, attendant dangers. And so, yeah, seeing, seeing how often the, the car was, was, was belittled and disparaged really surprised me. And at the same time, as, as you already alluded to, um, I was seeing quite often bikes were, were, um, were celebrated, were, were glamorized. They were depicted as being actually truly wonderful pieces of technology, which is kind of surprising because they're fairly, they're fairly low tech, they're fairly basic compared to a lot of the other furniture, if you will, that you see in a science fiction world, all the advanced tech. It's kind of surprising, I thought, to see bikes so often being held up as as truly, truly amazing and truly beneficial pieces of technology. Mm -hmm. um, so your, your first chapter, you highlight what's known as the golden age of science fiction um, and works that were at least edited or solicited in some way by a man, uh, I'm Maybe gonna get some names wrong. Forgive me, but Hugo Gernsback, I believe, is his name. Um, yeah, who's, that's a who's chapter he? On, yeah, uh, that's actually it's a chapter on the pulp era. Um, okay, 
Oh, sorry. Just, yes. Just want, yeah, I just want to clarify that. Um, so there is a chapter on the Golden Age area, right? And then, the, but the first one is actually on the on the pulp era, um, roughly the the twenties and thirties uh, era of science fiction. And so Gernsback was he's a a hugely important, hugely influential figure in the history of science fiction. He's a, a famous editor from the twenties and thirties who uh, edited what's often referred to as the first all science fiction magazine in the history of the genre. It's called Amazing Stories, comes out in 1926. He's also often credited with being the one, the man who coined our modern phrase science fiction. It's it's used before him, but not in a way that um, refers to what we would refer to as today science fiction literature. So he comes up with that phrase. Um, and so, he's, yeah, he's really important for just being this visionary who kind of saw there's this new form of literature that people are writing that's very tech focused and prophetic seemingly and depicting the future a lot. And he, he's the one who sort of seized on this as a, as in some ways a business opportunity, but also just, you know, he's, he knew it was important stuff. He knew it was stuff that needed to be um, published and have venues to publish it in. So he created these first magazines that were about, um, getting science fiction out into a broader, to the broader audience. So yeah, I, I write about him in that first chapter because he was, um, you know, he was, he, the, the stuff that he was into was, was, I think we'd call it, it uh, techno optimistic. He very much was a believer in the, in the power of technology, a believer in the power of um, science. He thought it could do good things in the world. And so when you read a lot of the stuff he's publishing in these early magazines, like Amazing Stories, a lot of time what you find is a celebration of technology, or even when there's moments where the technology breaks down or the technology goes awry, often what you see is the solution that's held up is, oh, we just need some better form of tech to fix the situation. We can always out-tech our way out of a bad tech situation or something like that. So yeah, I was interested in, in that chapter in looking at how how bikes and cars appeared in those early stories, uh, particularly in this environment of a uh, of a rampant techno um, techno optimism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm glad you corrected me on on the pulp age versus the golden age because one of the things I'm going to say is the golden age, which is your second chapter, um, is kind of more. Include some some maybe bigger name sci-fi authors who, you know, you might have heard of, or you've obviously right. heard of them, but yeah. who listeners might have heard of. Um, but this pulp chapter, a lot of the examples were people I'd never heard of, and, and kind of going in, I wasn't yeah. sure what to expect. Um, but it ended up being like a really fun chapter to read because there's all these wild stories you go through from this era. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah. I wanted to, to draw and bring up two of them to maybe go through as as a representative. Um, okay. So one of them is a story called Terror of the Streets. Um, oh, yeah. Can you yeah. tell us what that one's about? Yeah, the, the Terror of the Streets. So I, I think another important thing to, to, to foreground and emphasize about this, this pulp era is, yeah, I mean, one, as you point out, a lot of these people publishing in this, in this era, they're, they're pretty obscure names. A lot of them didn't survive into the, the later eras of, of sci-fi that we, we, tend to know of or read from today. Uh, so yeah, they're pretty obscure stuff, largely. But the other important thing to point out, the pulp era, fascinatingly, it, it coincides with this really important era in the history of of transportation. And it's something that um, the, the, the transportation historian, uh, Peter Norton, gets a lot of credit for writing about very eloquently and memorably. But, you know, he writes about the, the 20s and 30s being this really important moment where the streets were up for debate, essentially. For the longest time, streets were a commons. They were a place that people of, of many different social classes and engaging in a wide range of activities used. Streets weren't just for transportation for the longest time, the early 20th century and throughout most of the 19th century. They were places where people played kids played, there were places where people socialized, they sold things, there were little market stalls, and yes, there was transportation, there was, you know, horse and carriages and, and bicycles eventually and walking. And then in the 20s and 30s, you have this moment where 
the cars are, are starting to appear in, in greater numbers. Um, they're, they're selling in greater numbers. And suddenly you have this moment where these, these, these different uses of the street don't mix so well. People are getting killed. A lot of them are getting killed in the 20s. The, the rate of fatalities on the streets skyrockets. And so you have this moment where, you know, Peter Norton talks about how like the motor, motordom, they call themselves, the motor industry, decides they need to essentially wage this, this propaganda war where they um, decide people need to be corrected on this. They need to be taught that this, this new notion of the streets is going to be, this is a place for cars. Everybody else needs to get out, needs to stay out of this space. Mm -hmm. Kids, pedestrians, adults. And so what's interesting is then, yeah, science fiction really kind of comes of age, gets its first name from Hugo Gernsback in the 20s and 30s against the backdrop of this, this fascinating historical moment where the, the fundamental nature of the street is, is up for revision, is up for debate. And so getting back to the terror of the streets, it's this, this amazing story where, um, yeah, it's a story about this moment where there's many fatalities happening on the street. There's references to people being uh, killed. The streets are being dangerous, are increasingly becoming dangerous. And there's this one uh, character who decides he's going to to do something about this. And so he invents uh, a fantastic car that's nicknamed the Terror in the story. And he decides he's going to, in a sense, kind of become this vigilante character who goes out and, and protects the streets. He's going to go out and take all these um, dangerous drivers off the street. And so it's, I think this represents the, the techno-optimism that I was referring to very well, because it's this moment where you have a problem with a form of technology. Cars are killing people. Cars are dangerous on the streets. And you have this character who decides to fix the problem by just somehow creating a, a 2.0 version of the car that's supposedly safer, uh, better, superior than the other form of the car. And so, yeah, he essentially goes around and cleans up the streets a bit, makes them safer uh, at the same time as he himself is driving incredibly fast, but because he's in this more advanced car, can handle these speeds better. And it's, yeah, it's this moment that I think very nicely references this, this fascinating historical situation. The streets becoming increasingly dangerous, but people don't really know quite yet how to fix it. And you have a lot of the people in this pulp era who think maybe we can just engineer our way out of the problem. Well, the problem isn't cars. The problem is just the cars we have. So maybe if we could just come up with better versions of the car, superior versions of the car, that's the solution, they think. And that's what you see. That's what I saw a lot in these Paul Barra stories is um, people, people quite often uh, maligning the car, referencing the car in these very dark, very unfavorable terms. But at the same time, they, they, set up the stories to depict this way, the situation where if they just had better versions of cars, flying cars or, you know, better engineered cars, that would somehow address the problem. That would somehow fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we see that today too with self-driving cars and, and stuff like that. Um, Absolutely. People Absolutely. making similar yeah. arguments. Uh, there's, there's, I don't know if no one really though is proposing that, like the Batmobile goes around and rams like people parked in bike lanes or whatever, but I don't know. Right. Uh, another story though, that is, is kind of your one counter example from that period um, where that's not a purely sort of technological solution to the problem of cars is called the revolt of the pedestrians. Um, can you, yeah, tell us about that one. Yeah. The revolt of the pedestrians. Um, yeah. So this is one, uh, yeah, also from the the pulp era, one of the one of the bigger names of the pulp era, David uh, Keller wrote this one, and he's one who is a name that sometimes a lot of people uh, remember from this time period. And yeah, this was one where this stood out to me as as an anomaly, where you had this one story where it wasn't the the solution wasn't depicted as a as a techno fix that we could somehow uh, just improve the, the car technology. So this is a fascinating story where um, essentially uh, motorists and pedestrians are depicted in this, this futuristic world as, as literally having gone down two 
evolutionary pathways. I mean, Keller just sort of takes this extreme point or, you know, does this sort of classic sci-fi exaggeration and thinks that sort of people who drive and people who are walk, people who walk are becoming so different from each other, so distant that he literally depicts them as, as becoming like two species of humanity in the future. And yeah, he depicts the, the, the motorist as, as being, um, you know, eventually this, these sort of like wally kind of blobs who their, their bodies are, are atrophying. They drive around so much that they're, they can hardly even walk outside of the car. They can't walk, I think literally in the story. Uh, and the pedestrians are these people who still walk, but they're, um, yeah, they're almost being like hunted to extinction. There's these really, really just dark and, and sinister moments in the story where he depicts pedestrians getting getting run over at times by the motorist and, and the motorist just being like, um, you know, they hit a, hit a pedestrian bump and they ask, oh, what was that? And someone else in the car will say, oh, just a pedestrian. Oh, is that all? Well, no big deal there. And so he's, yeah, he's clearly alert and clearly aware of this this way in which uh, the cars are taking over and pedestrians are being relegated to this, this second class citizen status which again, I mean, in the 20s, this is this is brand new. This is brand new thinking. Just, you know, as Peter Norton teaches us just 10, 20, 30 years before this, the idea that cars owned the street and it didn't belong to pedestrians um, was just an absurd concept. I mean, that's like a new thing that's being referenced at this time and that the sci-fi writers are picking up on. So yeah, the, the revolt of the pedestrians is, is the title of the story um, implies. Eventually there's a you know, the kind of a revenge fantasy that, that culminates in the story where the, the pedestrians um, have their have their, their gory revenge on the on the motorist who um, had been hunting them early on in the story. And yeah, very a very dark story, but a very important one and, and very interesting for the for the way that it, 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 it resists the trend of thinking that there's some technological solution that can somehow uh, redeem the car or salvage the situation somehow. Mm -hmm. One of the things that stands out reading the whole book, but maybe especially the pulp era section, is the um, just sort of creativity of the premises. Um, you know, we have the two you mentioned. One that really stood out to me um, is there was one where like they make a self-driving car, but someone sabotages it by putting cocaine in the gasoline <laughs> and the self-driving car goes rogue and starts running people over. Right. Um, there, you know, you mentioned, a, I think a book from later on where the premise seems to be time travelers bring bicycles back to ancient Rome. Yeah. And yeah. There, there's just some ideas in here that made me think, Oh, that sounds fun. Um, yeah, yeah. what were you know, going back through all this, what were maybe one or two that you were really glad to have read for this project? Oh, you know, I mean, so many, as, as you point out. I mean, one of the things that was really fun about preparing to, to, to talk to you today, Dayton, was just sort of a flipping through the book and, and skimming through it again, just making sure I was a little fresh on fresh on the ideas and just yeah, seeing all these these titles and these names of works that I hadn't really thought deeply about for a while because you know the book was written you know a couple of years ago before it appeared in print and just yeah i mean just seeing all these titles and just quickly my mind flashing back to like oh yeah wasn't that a that a really fun book when i read that and some of the ones i really liked um that maybe i didn't do as much in the book as i as i could have because it doesn't really fit the argument or something i was making in a particular chapter but one thing that i really liked was these a couple of these books I found stories and books reference this idea of um, sometimes bicycles literally becoming like space travel uh, machines. And so mm -hmm. there was a whole sort of sub trend I found in like three or four works of, of yeah, bikes sort of flying, flying up to the moon. And to me, those were, yeah, really imaginative and really kind of wild reads at time. I mean, one in particular that I'll give, a shout out to is this really obscure book that it, it really was hard for me to track down even a copy of it to read was one called the man the man who rode his 10 speed to the moon 10 speed bicycle to the moon i think it's called so very yeah blunt title about what uh -huh. it's about and it was it was beautiful it was one of the most lyrical books i certainly read for this project it was very poetic it was written by a man who I have no idea anything about him. He was just this obscure name. 
I couldn't find anything else about him. As far as I know, he never wrote anything else. And it was uh, beautifully illustrated, too. It had a couple illustrations inside the book. And it was just, yeah, really, really lyrical. It was really poignant. It was about this this you know character dealing with this, the, I think his, his dog died, and he was just incredibly heartbroken about it. And he goes on this amazing journey up to the moon on his bike. And, you know, it feels very E.T., times two because he literally does go up to the moon on the flying bicycle Mm -hmm. and i really liked those there were a couple that were like this people people writing about the bike is literally becoming this kind of spaceship like um, machine but those were really fascinating you you mentioned the uh the the autonomous car that gets sabotaged with cocaine and and that was another thing that, that was fascinating with this project is seeing how often and how early on the idea of the autonomous car has been talked about. I mean, that's such a new concept that we're still quite quite giddy about right now, right? The idea of self-driving cars. But as is maybe no surprise, if you think about it for a moment, this, the science fiction writers have been thinking about this for over 100 years, right? They've been playing mm-hmm. around with this idea and depicting it and thinking through some of the the potential pitfalls or some of the potential benefits of autonomous technology, of autonomous cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I you mentioned E.T. I, I'll, hopefully, if we have time, we can get to some thoughts about E.T.'s bicycle. But um, for now, maybe let's keep chronological like your book does uh, and move into that golden age I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and one thing that stood out uh, is, is Ray Bradbury, you talk about um, what, like, didn't drive himself. Um, and, you know, people remember... Fahrenheit 451, perhaps, as as being you know critical of of TV's effect on people, um, but you draw out in that and some of his other work a strong, uh, you know, a car skepticism as well. Um, what can you yeah. expand on that? Uh huh. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So so as you pointed out, once we get to the the, the golden age era, right, we we reach some of these these bigger names that people tend to know, right? Bradbury first and foremost. But you know, Heinlein and um, you know Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov are, are part of this this era, but yeah, Bradbury is a, a fascinating character because yeah, as you point out, his his biography is really interesting. He moves to L.A. when he's he's a teenager. He moves there from Illinois, and he never he never learns to drive there. He's in one of the most car centric cities in the world. Probably some people would say certainly in the U.S. And he never drives. And there's these really f- wonderful interview moments where sometimes people ask him about this and he has some 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 great lines about this i mean i mean one thing he points out is that he doesn't drive because he's he's seen firsthand the horrors of the automobile and one of the interviews i found um in in my research there's one where somebody asked him about not driving and he says that he one reason he doesn't drive is because when he was 14 years old i think he was sometime around then he he heard a, a car crash right outside his house. He heard the screeching tires. He heard the, the you know, this, the cr- crush of the glass and heard, heard a car slam into, I think it was a telephone pole. And he goes out and he sees the carnage of a, of a car crash. And he has this moment where he talks about seeing a woman just before she dies with like her, her jaw hanging off. It's, you know, her jaw has been ripped from her face and it's just hanging there from one little piece of, you know, muscle or something like that. And he looks into her eyes and sees her die in that moment. And he, you know, just says, I've, I've seen what cars have meant for modernity. I'm not, I'm not on board with this. And so he says, you know, yes, cars have done lots of good things, but we have paid a horrible price for the car. I remember that line sticking out really well from one of his interviews. We've, we've paid a horrible price for the car. And so, yeah, when you get then to some of his fiction, particularly Fahrenheit 451, as you alluded to, most often we remember that as, as a book that's very anti-censorship. Uh, it's very anti-TV. But I think the third major component of that, that book that a lot of people don't remember or don't walk away noting as much about it as they could is it's yeah fiercely fiercely an anti automobile book the cars are depicted in there as being killing machines right there's this there's this sort of background entertainment that people are watching on the TV where people are watching these these like murderous car shows where people are like literally killing each other in their cars for like some 
uh, futuristic form of, of television spectacle. And the main, the main characters of that work, um, the fireman, Montag, and Clarice, um, they walk. I mean, they're notably walkers who uh, wax very poetic at times about um, what, what walking means to them and how it's a, a way to note things about the world they normally would miss. And that's the way those two characters first meet each other and sort of form a bond through meeting each other walking. And so, yeah, one of the, the stories that's a, a, pr a precursor to the Fahrenheit 451, the pedestrian, really uh, fleshes this idea out where you have a character who's out walking one night and he's the only one who walks in this town. It's, it's nightfall, it's totally deserted, and he's just walking down the street and just seeing all the windows of every, all of his neighbors illuminated by TV because that's what they're doing. They're inside watching TV. And he just walks, and he has the whole city to himself because it's considered um, a, a transgression to even be walking. And in fact, the story ends with him getting picked up, arrested by this sort of like futuristic autonomous police vehicle that uh, hauls him off to some sort of uh, like forceful rehab center. He's some center for retrogressive tendencies are going to be... Um, taken out of him because he's a walker and dares to walk. So yeah, Bradbury, a great, a great uh, proponent of, of walking and of great, um, yeah, um, villainizer of the, of the automobile in his fiction. Mm -hmm. I, you mentioned the, I want to return to that walking theme, but you mentioned the, uh, you know, depictions of like people fighting on cars and, in your next chapter, you have this story on auto dueling, uh, which is another, I thought, kind of wild premise. Um, yeah, yeah. It seems like, yeah, now that you point that out or uh, pivot to there from what we were just talking about. Yeah, I wonder if, if this the origin of this, is maybe these people had, had read, had noted this in, in Bradbury and in, in Fahrenheit 451, these sort of murderous car theme. Um, so, yeah, when, when you get to the next major era of science fiction, the, the, the so-called new wave era. One thing that I saw in, again, my, my reading and research was another interesting sub-theme happening in some of the works there was uh, the theme of, of, of auto-dueling is what one scholarly source I referenced called it, um, people using cars in these sort of futuristic battles. And I saw quite a few of those happening in in the the new wave era which is roughly the the sci-fi of the 60s and, and early 70s so yeah that got me thinking about why suddenly that became a theme why you suddenly see whatever five six seven notable works of science fiction eight nine ten referencing the the auto dueling scenario where people are using these cars and these these battle scenes and and if, and if you look at the historical context it was a moment where um suddenly the the roads were becoming more violent more dangerous um i think throughout the 40s and 50s there was a a dip a slight dip at least a notable dip in the the annual number of people killed on american roads but when you get to the 60s that number starts to to skyrocket again it goes up something like 10 15,000 um annually dead by the end of the 60s from where it started in the beginning of the 60s and, I mean, this is the famous era when Ralph Nader comes out with his um, famous car, his famous book, Attacking the Auto Industry for Prioritizing uh, Aesthetics Over Safety. And, yeah, it seems like it was a particularly dangerous moment on the roads where lots of people were uh, increasingly getting killed. And so, yeah, have, you have these stories that are, I think, are, are channeling this anxiety about how, how dangerous the roads are feeling feeling at that time they're channeling it and turning it into this creative raw material that they're now fashioning into these stories that are depicting the roads literally becoming these these places of of, of battle and carnage and, and and literal violence of people just going out and just killing each other for, for sport and spectacle and because they feel like it and i feel like that's yeah, that's 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 an it's an indirect way of referencing the anxiety people are feeling about the roads at that time. That they are just spaces that are increasingly feeling like they are associated with with blood and carnage and death, and they're not feeling safe anymore. And something needs to be done about it. And it's getting yeah tra transmuted into these interesting sci-fi stories of of, of auto dueling. 
And then to kind of return to that theme of walking, uh, maybe one of the more memorable walks in science fiction um, comes in The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin, um, yeah. Yeah. which I imagine uh, Le Guin, at least some of my listeners have, have read some of her stuff. Um, but yeah, I, again, sort of the, you know, I, I hadn't thought about when I first read that book a few years ago that like there are electric cars specifically in it. Um, and then, yeah, thinking about the walk as a, you know, part of a broader trend in transportation and sci-fi literature, like what, what can we take away from, from the left hand of darkness? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you point out, yeah, I think a lot of people probably read Le Guin. She's pretty well known and left hand of darkness is arguably her most famous work. And yeah, again, I mean, so much of what my project is trying to do is to, to, to foreground these moments that a lot of times get left in the background of people's reading experiences, right? A lot of times when people have been reading these science fiction works, I don't think people have been, been noticing enough how much transportation is an important component of them and important, an important element of them. And I think Left Hand of Darkness is, is a, a a great example of that, where so much of the discussion of that novel revolves around issues of, 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 of gender and sexuality and, you know, maybe politics next. But I think thirdly, there's there's quite a fascination with um, with transportation and mobility and energy happening in that novel. So one thing you see in, in that work is there there are cars, there are vehicles, notably there are electric cars being referenced quite often. So what I talk about in the 60s, I think you see in this new wave era, the era that the Gwyn is a part of, you see a bit of a bit of a resurgence of the techno optimism idea. I feel like from the pulp era, you see a bit of a return to that idea of, you know, hey, maybe maybe cars in and of themselves aren't bad we just need different versions of cars we need car 2.0 kind of thinking Mm -hmm. and we need we need cleaner cars um this is of course the 60s this is the era of the environmental movement really taking off and you have the the clean air act and endangered species acts and things like that so a lot of concern about pollution and air quality and so i think you see the gwyn thinking that maybe electric cars or just cleaner cars would be an improvement over the cars we have at the, at the time she was writing and then yeah it culminates in this this epic walk at the end of the book i think it takes up something like a quarter of the novel like the last quarter of the novel is this long description of the two main characters uh walking across the most desolate inhospitable frozen parts of this this uh planet they're on called Gethin. And the way she writes about that walk is, you know, yes, it's it's grueling. Yes, it's it almost kills them. But they also have these moments of, of just awe, and they have these like epiphany moments. And I think at one point, the character when he finishes the walk, it's like 800 miles they walked. He says something like, "I'm glad I've lived to see this," because he's at the end of that walk, he's beholding some great spectacle of of nature in front of him. And so, yeah, a lot of my book is, is, is not only about bicycles, but also about how, how walking and even things like skateboards, all of these quote-unquote more low-tech forms of transportation can be just, just more uh, fulfilling, more socially fulfilling, more in- individually fulfilling, more restorative, more, more benign, more benevolent forms of, of transport than what we have with, with the rampant automobility. Yeah, I, you know, I want to jump ahead a bit to to stay on the subject of walks. Um, Through this podcast, I host a book club for listeners um, where we can kind of dive into examples of the themes we talk about on the show. Um, And last year we read uh, The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, um, which is another book with, uh, you know, a a long walk um, and one that takes place in in this um, backdrop of, you know, social, economic, and ecological uh, breakdown. So it, it's somewhat, I think, less of a, um, quite less, not quite as much of a liberating walk, maybe, as as the other one, but there's still some, you know, powerful moments to it. So how does, how is walking similar and different in Parable of the Sower? 
Yeah, that's a good, yeah, a good, good comparison, a good parallel to put those two next to each other and, and compare the, the role of walking, the depiction of walking. And I think that, yeah, it is very similar because in both works, you have these characters who are more or less forced to undergo walks that they probably would have avoided if they, if they could have. Uh, the characters in Left Hand of Darkness are walking to literally save their lives and to, to get away from the, the captors who were holding one of the characters prisoner. And in Parable of the Sower, they're walking to try to find a safer place to live. Uh, Lauren, the main character of Parable of the Sower, and her, her group of people she's gathering around her are fleeing California. They're trying to get up north where they understand there's maybe safer living conditions and more jobs and things like that. So yeah, walking in both is is grueling at times. It is hard work it is it is laborious and it is dangerous but at the same time both works clearly reference it as being uh you know having some real spiritual benefits and emotional benefits and i think what's really interesting about parable of the sower is you know obviously as the title of the book itself references uh one of christ's parables it's there's this whole religious uh religious element to Parable of the Sower, where Lauren, the main character, is a um, she's she's developing a new religion as she's walking up north. She's literally becoming a a a religious leader. She's developing her own religion that she thinks is is preferable to all the other organized religions of of her time, Christianity most notably. And so I think it's interesting how as she keeps walking and keeps gathering followers, she keeps taking in other. Uh, vulnerable people and telling them, you know, stick with us, walk with us, we're going to a safer place, we'll, we'll take care of you, as long as you take care of us too, you know, you look out for us, we'll look out for you. And so her walking, I feel like, takes on these these really rich, uh, luminous, if you will, associations of, of Christ-like walking, right, just as we know Christ walked all over Judea and, and gathered disciples and spread his gospel we see see Lauren, the character in, in Parable of the Sower, doing that as well. You know, walking down the roads, walking up north, walking the highways, which in Butler's novel are in, uh, increasingly devoid of cars because hardly anybody's driving in the bleak future she depicts because gasoline is rare. Nobody has the money to keep a car around, so people are walking more, biking more, and yeah, she she kind of leans into what could be positive about that, the idea that, that walking is what often brings people together. Hikes and, and long walks and long bike rides allow people to foster social connections and foster community in ways that we know the car just never has and never will will do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, I think, the ability of these sorts of modes of transport to, to foster community is important, whether it's walking in, in Butler or um, you know, maybe later we'll talk about how paper girls and, and biking, um, you know, bike messengers sort of form a, and, and yeah. really multiple works you talk about form communities. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's the classic example, right? The sort of bike messenger community of this idea of, of, of just the, the inherent joy of biking sometimes. I mean, bike messengers, notoriously, it's a, it's a grueling job out there in all sorts of weather delivering messages, particularly back in the 80s and 90s when this was really still a thing, really hard work, but supposedly the people who, who did it um, swore they loved it. And there's just the community of, of messengers, the way the bike uh, just brought those people together and allowed them to, to, to bond over biking and socialize over their biking in their spare moments. And so there's a few sci-fi works that I reference where the, the, the messenger character, the messenger figure shows up in um, some of some of Gibson's works and some of Stevenson's science fiction, so I thought mm -hmm. that was interesting how they were, yeah, they were channeling this 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 famous this this famous example of of the ways in which modes of transportation can increase conviviality, can increase sociality. Well, um, you you bring up a you know a potential risk that some of those stories run as well. Um, you know, you mentioned E.T. earlier. Um, and you have a chapter where you talk about sort of the some of the spiritual successors to E.T., such as Super 8 and Stranger Things, um, more recently, where 
biking is this, um, you know, kids are able to outbike people in cars chasing them, and and the the cars are generally associated with with villainous scientists, and and kids on bikes are the heroes. Um, but where biking is also sort of intentionally or not cast as like an exclusively youthful thing. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, you mentioned that you bike everywhere is your main mode of transportation. Uh, I would say it's, it's my main mode of transportation, but a, uh, yeah, I, I think in, in a lot of culture, it's sort of seen as a thing kids do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the book ends with, you know, the chapter you're alluding to, it ends with what I saw as one of the more fascinating uh, recent trends in science fiction, which is the, the whole, what I call 80s nostalgia, sci-fi, what sometimes is called like the kids on bikes subgenre of, of TV and, and film and, and things like that happening. So yeah, Stranger Things and, and, and Paper Girls and comics and uh, Super 8 going back to like a, a, an earlier movie. Um, and yeah, and so it's interesting. Obviously, I think, yeah, the Spielberg's E.T. is kind of lurking in the background of, of all of these works. One of the most famous movies, one of the most, most famous works of, of film sci-fi, certainly. And it's famous depictions of, of the bicycle and the flying bicycle and in front of the, the, the luminous moon. And so you know, a lot of these works, like, like Stranger Things, are, are picking up on these, these images, are picking up on these motifs. And so on one level, what I talk about in this, that chapter, this final chapter of the book, is I think that's, that's great because I think always it's wonderful for at least me to see these, these moments in pop culture, in, in popular TV shows and in popular movies and comic books where, the, where even if it's kids, anybody's still biking. And it seems like they are getting lots of joy out of it. It is something that they're uh, bonding over with other kids. It's something that sort of keeps the group together, right? If you think about Stranger Things, the, the, the main boy protagonists are almost always biking everywhere together, and that's how they sort of move around their town and go from house to house. It's something that um, allows their, their friendship to be as, as robust as it is on some level. And so that's great. But then on the other hand, what I was noticing in these, these various works, Paper Girls, Super 8, um, stranger things is that unfortunately it's always kept at the level of k just kids biking so I was trying to be very alert and trying to note what there's moments where any adults are ever shown biking as well because I, I think as you kind of point out it's important to also acknowledge and reference that biking is a uh, perfectly legitimate and respectable and 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 cheap and efficient and sustainable and environmentally friendly all these things way for adults to move around too to get from you know their home to job if they can and things like that and uh, across the board in all these works I, I you didn't see any adults there was just little glimmers of it at times and like stranger things for example there's quick little visual references that maybe one of the the teachers who the boy are, are the boys are quite close with their science teacher Seems like he bikes, but that's just very quickly alluded to. And so, yeah, I, I found that a bit problematic. Um, that was something I was a little critical of in these works. And then also the fact that you hardly ever see um, women or girls biking in these these films and comic books and TV shows as well was another thing I noted. I mean, it's, it's always, it seems like it's a monopoly of, of young young boys to have this this freedom and this joy and this joyous form of movement uh you never really saw any of the the female characters you never really you know it always struck me that it was odd that as as much as the character of 11 in stranger things became an important part of that group she never got her own bike and she never was allowed to bike around with uh the boys she always just sort of had her her secondhand mobility as I call it at one point because at times she's just riding on the back of one of the boys bikes and yeah to me that was that was an oversight that was a, a bit of a problem it would have been nice if these 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 works that are, are are doing amazing things glamorizing the bike one of the things I talk about in the chapter that I learned about when I was writing the chapter was the the wild success of of Stranger Things has led to um, some bike manufacturers creating special Stranger Things bikes that are meant to look deliberately like some of the main characters 
bikes that they ride in the show. And these are these are selling out incredibly quick. You can't you can't even really get one because of how quickly once they go on sale, they're selling out. So they're doing a lot to promote cycling and make cycling um, people excited about cycling in these interesting ways. But the fact that it is always limited to just sort of like young male mobility mm-hmm. to me is is not is not good, right? Because I think ideally we need we need we need texts and we need works of mass media that present the idea that biking is 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 wonderful for all people and it should be accessible to all people and adults should be embracing it um, in an increasingly climate changed world as a as a good way to get around if they can and do their their daily um, fulfill their daily mobility needs mm-hmm. yeah I, w- I wanted to take maybe the last 10 minutes or so to um, return to a couple examples that do bring out kind of the environmental and or climate element of, of this with you know air pollution and carbon emissions um, sort of adding to the car's toll. Um, and there's one uh, influential environmental utopia you mentioned from 1975 called Ecotopia um, that sort of imagines how people might get around um, in, in an Ecotopia. Uh, so yeah. how do people get around and kind of what has been the influence of, of that book or the ideas in it yeah uh, ecotopia it's 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 an interesting book because it seems like it's it's both uh it seems like it's both been been largely forgotten in the sense that most people most uh mainstream most readers of casual readers of science fiction probably don't know of it um it doesn't usually i, I don't think it get brought up in, in most other discussions of science fiction or even like the era of, of, that it comes out in, uh, the new wave era. I, I've never seen the book referenced in like a chapter of a, a history of science fiction, for example, on the new wave era as like an important text. So in some ways it, it's kind of been forgotten, um, even when people are thinking about the history of utopias in science fiction. And of course there's a long history of them. Wells, H.G. Wells was writing quite a few of them during his career and late 19th, early 20th century, and uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Her Land, and Ursula Le Guin did some amazing utopias like The Dispossessed, her ambiguous utopia. So there's a long history of them, and then what I find is, is ecotopia doesn't usually get brought up in connection with those other works. But on the other hand, my understanding is it's it, it was it was a very famous book in its time and still continues to sell well. The hippies, the, the counterculture of the 60s and 70s, or 70s when the book came out, really, really embraced the book and, and knew of it, and it was influential uh, uh, to, amid a certain group of people. And so, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting book. It, it, it does have the, um, it does suffer from a thing that a lot of utopian books suffer from, which is a lot of times utopias are just sort of like, okay, here's this new world. I'm going to take a stranger who's never been to this world, and they're going to visit it, and then I'm going to have another character who goes around and shows them all the different elements of the world. So, okay, here's here's our education system. Here's our legal system. Here's our you know, sanitation system or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, the sci-fi scholar Brian Aldiss, I think the way he memorably disparages this as he calls these works um something like they're they're like they're like a visit to the zoo where you just walk from cage to cage to cage and just like gawk at the next thing and so the book has that sort of thing that sort of stagnation but on the other hand it does have these amazing ideas and these uh, wonderful visions of what a a more environmentally sustainable futuristic society could look like um and particularly in the transportation realm, right? That's obviously what I was most interested in. And he depicts a, a an ecoto- ecotopian society. This is in the Pacific Northwest where Kallenbach depicts it. It's a sort of breakaway um, state from the rest of the United States, creates this new country, Ecotopia. And they've they've largely banished the car. I think in, in the work he says there's no, no one's allowed to have private automobiles anymore. There's still automobiles for moving around goods and things like that, I believe. But other than that, people are having to rely on public transportation. He depicts a very clean, very efficient, very well-run public transportation system instead that people use. And beyond that, uh, the bicycle. People are using uh, the bicycle to, to, uh, to a high degree. In fact, he has this wonderful moment where he references the, uh, the Provo 
uh, bike group from the the sixties, this famous group of uh, Dutch anarchists who started who started yes. what's often credited as being the first bike share movement, and so he sort of pivots off that and, and name drops the sort of Provo Dutch anarchist by having his characters using a bike free bike share where there's just these bikes that are just left around where if you need a bike you need to get somewhere you just find the nearest bike that's been abandoned on the curb or whatever and ride off on it and so yeah I'm, I'm interested in these works that show these sci-fi works that show futuristic societies that have rejected the car rejected automobility and yet it's a depiction of the society where they have not been um, they've, they've not been locked into immobility or they've not been imprisoned. In fact, they still are getting around just fine. They seem happy. They seem content. It seems like they are flourishing and thriving despite having no automobiles or having limited access to automobiles. And I feel like those are, those are the images we need right now. Those are the, the powerful ones that we, we need models we need things to aspire to we need these these uh hopefully prescient science fiction images of, of what a society could look like that's built around um, different forms of mobility different technologies of, of transport than we have right now well one of my favorite examples of that is the 1990 kim stanley robinson novel pacific edge um where people it's set in like a utopian future, a town in Southern California where people bike around everywhere. And it seems like you can maybe get like a publicly owned car. You can borrow it if you need to go out of town. But for the most part, people take trains or boats if they're going far away. And and to get around town, they walk and bike. Um, and Kim Stanley Robinson is someone who I uh, interviewed on the show last year, which was really fun. And um, you wrote an article about one of his more recent books, uh, New York 2140, um, separate from, from the book that you wrote, uh, about this idea of, you call automobility without automobiles. Yeah. What, yeah. what does that mean? Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. New York 2140, uh, fascinated me is, 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 I mean, my favorite Kim Stanley Robinson novel, but also as a as a reader and also a scholar, because it just fascinates me the ideas he has going on in there. But yeah, the thing that really interested me was his his vision of this futuristic society where, um, I mean, it's a New York that's half flooded by climate change, so automobility has been abandoned in at least the part of New York that he focuses on the the half flooded part of Manhattan, because obviously you can't drive cars around on flooded streets so automobility is just not really cars are not really present in 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 the world of the novel of new york 2140 but what i noticed was that he he, he seemed to take great delight in depicting the way in which the characters of that book are still using boats to get around and are still you know there's still rush hour traffic and there's still people racing around manhattan using these boats in ways that very much resemble the way cars are used right now in in New York in New York City, and so I was fascinated about what what was going on, what 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 he was up to there. And so my argument is, what I thought is that he's he's depicting the way in which a lot of transportation scholars like to reference the idea that that automobility is this this really huge, powerful force, this assemblage of forces that is so much greater than just the actual car, greater than the materially existing car. It is this network of, um, of, of signs and legal systems and all the different ways in which our, our society has created a system that promotes the car and benefits the car. And so if you're going to try to reduce car use, for example, you can't just go after taking the cars off the road. You need to think about how is our how is our culture promoting cars? How is our music? How is our movies? How is our legal system? All these other factors. And so what I thought he was up to in that book was this very interesting depiction of how automobility might be the system that is so much bigger than cars that it can even survive the extinction of cars. Like after cars essentially go extinct in the Manhattan that he writes about, people just find other ways to use other things in in car like manners they're just using these boats to now um, zip around and try to move around as super fast and efficiently as possible 
I argue in there that one of the the main characters, the uh, the main finance wizard guy, the the, the story, he's using the boat to s still like how people used to use cars to project his 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 virility, to project his masculinity. He's zipping around in this super expensive hydrofoil boat that moves faster than all the other ones, and is a way that he's projecting his status as a as a powerful, successful male because that's the way a lot of people today use cars. And so when the car vanishes in that world, all he does is just find some other form of transportation to do that. And that's, you know, that's kind of what we're getting at with automobility is, is automobility is not just about the cars. It's about, you know, issues of, of, of masculinity too and gender things. And it's this really complicated, complex web of, 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 of factors and forces that you, you know, to really try to reduce car use and reduce the way in which the car runs our society, you gotta really think about all these different ways you have to uh, sort of, uh, you know, identify, you know, it's, it's Gorgon-like, it's multi-headed, it's this Hydra thing. And so I, th I thought he was very clever in that novel and depicting the way in which Automobility might be so huge, so powerful, so pervasive. It's it's bigger than just cars. It's bigger than just the material existing car. It can still survive even the extinction of the of the car in some way, which I thought was, if I'm if I'm right, what he was up to, I thought it was brilliant the way he he laid that out in the book. Well, that makes me excited to read it. One of the handful of his I have not gotten to yet, um, but I really should. Uh, yeah, I you know, there's so much more in the book, so many more examples, uh, different ways of looking at this um, that people can um, check out if they like to, Futuristic Cars and Space Bicycles. Is there anything else that you want to add or talk about? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, maybe I'll just, I'll just end. Is I remember you you asked me in an, in an email about, you know, a, a book that I would recommend for, for people who are interested in, in transportation issues or mobility issues. And I'll just give a shout out to the one I, I mentioned to you. It's, it's not, it's not science fiction, but, um, HG Wells's The Wheels of Chance is a delightful book from the 1890s. Arguably, I think the, the greatest book ever written about cycling and about the joys of, of cycling and about the, the liberatory, powers of the bicycle it's a wonderful moment that captures this great moment in the history of transportation where yes the car had been invented but it hadn't yet overrun our societies at the time when the bikes were were all the rage and everybody was just um mad for bicycles and it is a a humorous novel a funny novel a well-written novel but also a poignant novel at times it ends in such a heartbreaking way as well um, I, I really recommend that book. Um, I don't think people read that enough or know of it uh, nearly as much as they should, but The Wheels of Chance by H.G. Wells is a really, a really great one. Thanks for that. Yeah, I've, I've added it to my to-read list uh, based on your rec, nice, and I'm, nice. yeah, I'm excited for it. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, yeah, thanks so much for joining me, Jeremy. This was fun. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. It was fun talking to you. Thanks so much for listening. That was Jeremy Withers, author of Futuristic Cars and Space Bicycles, Contesting the Road in American Science Fiction. If you are listening to this as a Patreon subscriber, that is if you're listening early, you may still have a chance to vote on what our next book club book will be, and it might be uh, that H.G. Wells book um, that Jeremy Withers suggested. I've listed that as an option, um, Wheels of Chance. Uh, I also have as an option Pacific Edge um, by Kim Stanley Robinson, which I briefly mentioned in the podcast. Um, I have an Ursula K. Le Guin book in there and a couple other options as well. Um, so voting for that will close uh, on June 23rd. Um, so try to uh, vote now if you can. Um, and <laughs> if you're listening to this when it actually comes out publicly, um, then you actually already know the results of that vote because it is after June 23rd. So you can just find out what book won uh, by going to my website, datonmartindale.com slash book hyphen club, uh, and to see if it is something that you are interested in reading with us. Um, the date will be August 1st. Thanks so much.
For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Oh.